All right, so the question is which, if any, of these propositions are momentous? What would be the consequences if they were true? Let's consider the first one. Rationality requires that you eliminate any known contradictions. Well, here's the consequence. If you're going to be rational, you have a lot of work to do now. A lot of work. Resolving contradictions is not an easy thing. Finding contradictions is not an easy thing. It requires training and, amongst other things, propositional logic. You have to understand some of the basics about even what it means to be a contradiction. Investigating which beliefs you have is a lengthy process. And it, on top of that, trying to determine which ones you've kept over time, which ones really matter, maybe which ones are fleeting, that sort of thing. Even ranking them. Because you are going to have probably a rather large set of beliefs that can't all be true together. If rationality does not require uh, resolving known contradictions, rationality is cheap. It's like, what good is it then? I'm rational and I have contradictory beliefs. You can take such things as I believe it is raining right now, therefore unicorns exist but actually have six legs, not four. Like, well, that's a ridiculous consequence. Well, okay, yes, it is an absolutely ridiculous consequence. But if eliminating contradictions is not part of how you reason, you can reach any conclusion you want. So if rationality does not require eliminating known contradictions, rationality is cheap. There is a moral order. If that's true, you better figure it out. I mean, imagine there's a real answer, right? According to this proposition, there's a real answer to the question, how should you live your life? You probably ought to figure out the answer to that question. And again, this is going to require a lot of study. You take introduction to ethics, you're going to realize there's at least a good dozen or so ethical theories to choose from. There's probably more than that, depending on how you're really going to nuance them. But yeah, there's going to be at least a good dozen or so moral theories and trying to learn what they are, the difference between them, because they can't all be true together. And trying to figure out which one is right is a very daunting task. So if it's true that there is some sort of moral order, there's an answer to the question, how should you live your life? You better figure out which one it is. And start living that way. On the other hand, if there is no moral order, there's a huge consequence there. Now, there's no answer to the question, how should you live your life? How should you live your life? No answer. I think I'll go collect peanuts. Okay. Wait, wait. Isn't that being lazy? Isn't that, you know, putting your own life in danger? You can't live off that thing? Yeah, but it's not like, it's not like we can answer the question, how should you live your life by something like try to live as long as you can. That would be an answer to the question. If there is no answer to the question, how should you live your life? It doesn't matter what you do. Your life has no meaning. Next one. Um, there are, you know, some things are physical. You know, I know this sounds kind of heretical, <laughs> but okay. I mean, maybe one of the consequences is uh, it'd be good to figure out how things work together. All right. I mean, I, I guess that's fine. But it doesn't require that much investigation to figure that part out. You know, we got along very well for centuries, having really bad ideas about the causal relationships between material objects. And we not only survived, but we thrived. I mean, yeah, granted, we did a lot better once we figured out the scientific method and how to apply it, got principles of engineering. Sure. We did better after that, sort of. You know, we seem to be engineering ourselves out of existence. But nevertheless, it's like some things are physical. If somebody ran, you know, came up to you and said, some things are physical, you'd be like, yeah. So? I mean, here's the really interesting thing. If Barclay's right, and all of this is just minds and ideas, none of this is actually physical, uh, you'd still probably have to go through the world in the same way as if things were physical, right? It's not like, say, aha, you know, Barclay's not going to say, aha, this is an idea, therefore you can walk through it. Barclay says, no, right? You're still going to bump into it. 
right? You're still going to have hardness there, right? <laughs> you bump into things like that, they hurt. So whether the world is, you know, whether something's a physical or not, how you get about it in the world is probably not going to be that different. So that's, that's kind of an odd consequence of that one. That, may, that one, that's really not momentous. It's really not that thrilling or exciting or life altering. On the other hand, if some things that exist are not physical, you better figure out which ones, what they are. I mean, numbers are a good contender. Logical relations are another truth. I mean, it, that whole moral order business, if there, if there is a moral order, I mean, there is such a thing as goodness. Well, goodness doesn't have a chemical composition, so you better figure out what it is. You better learn how to understand it and you know here's a really good question if some things out there that exist are not physical how do you know about them because you can't see them that would be very strange aha uh -huh, there's two there it goes did you see it no it doesn't work that way so if there are if some things that exist that are non-physical yeah that that's life altering because now you gotta understand you gotta figure out which ones are they because it can't just be any proposed thing right you got to figure out which ones exist. How do you even know about them? And what am I supposed to do with this? You know, if numbers are real, how do I learn about them? How do I use them? If everything's physical, right? If everything, all this, everything that exists is physical, uh, yeah, that, that's a huge problem. Because uh, now numbers, by the way, are gone. Or at least you got to give some account of numbers that they're physical. And maybe, maybe, maybe you can get away with counting numbers, like one, two, three, four. It's like, ah, oh, that's one thing, that's two things, that's three things. Aha, no problem. You know, because you could point to those. But you start getting to things like zero. How many physical things you got in front of you? Zero. <laughs> no. If everything that exists is, is physical, zero doesn't exist. All the negative numbers, they're gone too. Imaginary numbers, that's gone. By the way, we still need imaginary numbers to get to the moon. So if everything that exists is physical, there are no non-physical things, uh, you're going to start accounting for a lot of these things that we, that we do talk about and seemingly use that are not physical, such as numbers, truth, logic, relationships, morality. Uh, some sort of divinity. There's some sort of divinity. Yeah, huge consequence. If there is some sort of divinity, it would be nice to know which one. And there's lots of contenders. You got the Trinity, you got Yahweh, you got Allah. Um, Buddha's technically not a divinity. Uh, you got hundreds of gods of Hinduism, hundreds, literally hundreds of gods of Hinduism. And those are just the ones that are you know still floating around as the, as the quote unquote major religions today. But there's still lots of other religions out there. There are still, Say, for instance, First Nations tribes that have their own mythos, that have their own theology. Um, they, maybe it's that one, right? I mean, can you imagine if the Greeks had it right all along, right? If the ancient Greeks had it right, and Zeus, right? Zeus is the top divinity that's out there. If that's true, wow, we better figure that out. You better start erecting those temples and you know, getting the sacrifices going again. So, yeah, if there's some sort of divinity... You better figure out which one, right? because it's prob that's probably going to have an impact on your life. I, I, I can't think of a single religion that says, ha ha, here's this divinity, but whether you believe it or not doesn't matter. And maybe there is one, maybe, but I, I can't think of it. On the other hand, if there's no divinity, there's still a huge consequence. If there's no divinity, we have to figure out how it is and why it is that we, as a species, have made the single biggest mistake in all of our history. Across time and across our history, across cultures, as far as I know, every single one or the overwhelming, at least the overwhelming majority of these cultures have talked about some sort of divinity. There are pockets of you know, various atheistic sort of ways of going about this. Okay, and I'm not knocking atheism, right? I'm not knocking atheism. I'm not even knocking agnosticism. I mean, if this proposition, right, if there is no divinity, you know, the agnostics and, you know, or the, sorry, the atheists and the leaving, you know, to some extent, the agnostics say, what's it? There we go. Figure that out. 
atheists are saying we were right all along. It's like, yeah, but if you were right all along, how is it that we as a species made this mistake for centuries, century, millennia, millennia? How did we make this mistake for millennia? You know, I, I can understand, you know, an isolated culture making a mistake. Okay. Or even, you know, several cultures making a mistake, maybe picking it up for a while, then dropping it. Okay, I, I get that, right? Sure. But almost everyone, if not everyone, and again, maybe I'm mistaken here, but as far as I know, every culture has had some sort of divinity. So yeah, if there is no divinity, we've got to be able to answer this question. Because if we made this mistake before, we really want to avoid making this mistake again. And, you know, by the way, you know, second humanists, agnostics, atheists, um, you're relying upon the power of human reason to, you know, figure it all out, right? Be it obtaining peace on this planet or going to the stars or, you know, transcending our physical selves through computers, whatever, right? Whatever the answer is if there's no divinity, um, or, you know, just death, right? <laughs> just death. Uh, you know, you claim that human reason is going to figure all this out. Well, if human reason is going to figure this out, and human reason is also responsible for the single biggest mistake in all of our history, why think that human reason can do this? That's a huge problem. All right, I realized in the middle of my videoing that I forgot to include one uh, part of our discussion. So I have to borrow from my animated self here to get to the last part. Uh, so we're gonna ask ourselves, you know, we're asking uh, what are the consequences of some of these uh, options and uh, whether they're momentous. And we are covering there is some absolute truth which is kind of a big thing to say that there's something true regardless of any circumstances, regardless of anything else. So one question we have to ask, well, what are they? We have to figure out. That's a, uh, that itself is a tough thing to do. How do we know them? Which is kind of involved in this whole notion of what are they? And trying to know something that's true regardless of any circumstance seems to mean that we know something across all circumstances, which, especially since we don't, which is weird since we don't experience all circumstances. Uh, and our minds must conform to reality and not vice versa. We um, don't really like this because we like to think that we know what we're doing and, and, and that, you know, reality is going to do what we want and <laughs> not the other way around. You know, this pops up in lots of different ways. Anything from uh, uh, what, you know, you visualize your future, you... Uh, make things happen through your beliefs. Uh, if you believe hard enough, you make it true. Right? The, uh, when we're talking about reality conforming to our beliefs and not vice versa, it, it doesn't really work this way. It doesn't work this way at all. So we looked at there is some absolute truth. We just talked about the consequences of that. And then we now we have there is not some absolute truth. Well, what are the momentous consequences of this one? Uh, well, first of all, let me ask you something. What kind of statement is there is not some absolute truth that's right it's an absolute one that means if this is true it's false that seems a little weird doesn't it we also don't like this one because it, it's a country <laughs> a self-contradiction yet the intuition that there's not something true across all circumstances is really sticking with us you know um but if this is true that there's no absolute that there's not some absolute truth, it's also false. Hmm. Well, that's it for my cartoon self. Let's get back to the uh, self at Canyon Lake. Knowledge requires consensus. If knowledge requires consensus, <laughs> this one's got a really big consequence because not everybody believes this. Right? <laughs> there is not consensus on the idea that knowledge requires consensus. Knowledge, you know, consensus is required for mathematics and science. Okay, cool, right? Those two got no problem there. Uh, but if not, right, other fields like, no, we don't really need consensus for this. We can have knowledge without consensus. 
it, you know, I'm talking quite a lot of different fields here. Uh, you know, it, it, these other fields don't require consensus. So uh, if they don't, then this proposition, not right now, it requires consensus. We don't have consensus for it, therefore we don't know it. That, that, that would be a big problem. You know, even if you tried to say knowledge required consensus, just like math and science, knowledge requires consensus. Like, okay, but not everybody can, you know, agrees on this, so you don't know it. And if knowledge does not require consensus, what's the good of consensus? I mean, yes, we, you know, we don't have consensus, but it tends to be a good thing that if you find more than one person agreeing with you. <laughs> I mean, if, if somebody came along and said, I have figured out that water is not actually composed of the hydrogen monoxide, it's composed of two other completely different elements. And that, like, that was the lone chemist out there saying that. It's like, okay, yeah, that guy's a nut job. Yeah. But if there was a, you know, a significant number of people started agreeing, was like, yeah, you know, we took a look at this evidence. It looks pretty good. I mean, he's got, he's got a point. Oh, okay, I mean, that would be something. But if knowledge doesn't require consensus, what good is it that more people agree? I mean, we, we do this, right? We have our bandwagons. We have our fads. We, I mean, there's all kinds of moral beliefs, for instance, that are changing right now because there's different consensus or consensus is gathering around a different proposition right, or a different belief. Okay, I mean, it, it's becoming more and more popular, but if knowledge does not require consensus, so what? More people believe it. That doesn't, make it, doesn't mean it's more persuasive or it's more true. There's more evidence. Nothing like that. Who cares? And if, if consensus is not required, why do we place so much value on in the mathematics and, science, in mathematics and sciences? That doesn't matter. Some minds are non-physical. Wow. <laughs> this is a can of worms. If our minds are not physical, I mean, a whole slew of questions come up. How does the mind interact with the brain? Because we tend to think that physical things just impact other physical things, and nothing really goes beyond that. Let me understand neurons firing, maybe, you know, neurons firing causes movements, right? This is neurons firing. Oh, okay. But now we say, oh, the mind is involved too. But where is it? Well, you know, it's just there. If the mind is not physical, my mind is not here. Physical things have location. Non-physical things do not. You know, <laughs> if my mind is not here, right, I am very literally having an out-of-body experience all the time. <laughs> If, if your mind is not physical, how would you even begin to understand what the mind is? If the mind is not physical, you don't even know what you are. You study physical things, not non-physical things. But the mind is just physical, if that, that's all there is to it. Well, in all likelihood, you know, this is your time, here and now. That's it. One and done. And you know, your mind is still a mystery. And we say, yeah, there's neurons firing. Like, yeah, but neurons still don't look anything like the color blue. So what's this relationship supposed to be? Even if it's true that minds are physical, why are we so seriously deluded about the nature of minds when we seemingly understand the nature of brains? There is... Uh, an existence, or you know, there's an existence. Next proposition, right? There's an existence before your physical birth. Okay. Wow. <laughs> uh, kind of like to know what that was, because I don't have any memory of it. And if my existence before my birth affects my life now, how? And more importantly, why? Because I don't remember that, right? If I don't remember doing it. If that's not part of my makeup now, why am I being affected by that now? Or worse, if you have an existence before your physical life and it doesn't affect you at all in any way, shape, or form here and now, what's the point of that physical life? That, that's, that, that, that seems like a really big empty part of my life, my existence that I know I don't have any access to and doesn't have any impact on what I do now. An existence after physical life, after physical death. Sure like to know what it's going to be. 
I'd like to be able to plan for it. I'd like to be able to prepare for it. You know, I've made huge plans about, you know, even the next 30 years. I am acting on a, on a, you know, acting on a plan right now for just the next 30 years of my life. If I'm going to exist so much longer after that, <laughs> I really like to be able to, you know, set myself on the right track now. I mean, maybe I'll make a huge mistake. On the other hand, if there's no existence after physical death, this is it. One and done. One and done. You have this life. This, after this life is done, that's it. You know, this is where usually some people say, well, I want to leave behind a legacy. It's like, oh, okay, I guess you can if you really want to, but it's not like that legacy is going to affect you after you're dead. I want people to remember me. So what if they do? It's not like that affects you. You're gone. You cease to exist. You can't be happier with people remembering you because you ain't. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like you ain't happy. It's just you ain't. <laughs> so really, pretty much all of these beliefs, with the exception of me, you know, some things are physical. That one probably doesn't have any real significant consequences. I mean, if it's false, if all things are non-physical, it really doesn't change your life that much. But if, you know, pretty much all of these beliefs, or, so all these propositions, they are momentous. They have huge consequences if they're true. If they're true. And whether you believe them or not, if there is a moral order. If there, if there is an actual answer to this question, whether you believe it or not, does not change how you answer the question, uh, how you, you know, doesn't change the answer to that question. If you don't believe that's the right way to live your life, you're wrong. <laughs> And then you're living your life wrongly. So yeah, all of these are momentous. They all have very real consequences if they're true. And very real consequences, whether you believe them or not.